Hello and welcome to church, everybody. I'm so glad that you're here. You're joining us, tuned in. It's going to be an amazing day. I have no doubt about it. And I'm so glad that we still get to worship together like this. And as Roxy mentioned, next weekend we have both church online and we have in-person gatherings. So please jump in. Registrations will be open from Monday and you can go to our website to register. You can also find out through all of the processes and procedures that we're going to have there uh, so that you can get ready for services. We are absolutely thrilled that we are going to be able to be back in the building together. Even though it is at a reduced capacity, we missed you. We can't wait to see you. But yay, Church Online is still going and still going strong. And so we are so grateful. You know, the, the Romans built roads and the message of the gospel went out on the roads. Today, we send out the message of the gospel on the internet highway, right? Come on. And the gospel keeps going out. And so we're going to stay committed to both. Uh, Our new service times will be 8.30, uh, 10.30, and 5.30 p.m. And so we're looking forward to kids um, services through all of those as well. So look forward to seeing you there and then. And uh, this is my first week back from leave, so it's so good to be back and to be uh, with our team as we dream about uh, all that God wants to do in and through this series, particularly um, on Ecclesia, Ecclesia, on the church. It's really about a series about what the church is. And I just say it like that because I wanted to sound smart. I have no idea exactly how to say it, but we just go in with it, all right? Um, and Ecclesia is, is really a series about the church. What is the church exactly? Is the church all about filling seats, taking money, and doing good works in the community? Is there more to it? Is the church even relevant today? Is the church significant? Is there a plan and a purpose for the church? And what is our role within the church? And that's what we want to go through in this series. But before I go any further, let me pray, and then we're going to jump into the message this morning. Father, I thank you that we get to be in your house, God. I thank you that there is no better place to be than here, whether it's in the morning or in the evening or whenever people are watching this message, God, I thank you that we get to gather around your name. May your name be made famous in Jesus' name. Lord, may, may this message go out and not return void, but achieve everything you wanted to achieve, God. Give you all the glory and all the praise. Speak to our hearts and give us a revelation of the church that you are building. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So today I want to start us off and kick us out on an introduction. We're kind of just going to push away from shore today to see what it is the church is about. And I want to take us back to the beginning, the church unstoppable, the church back in the beginning. The reason why I want to take us back to the beginning is because if we ever lose our why, we will lose our way. Jesus has a plan for the church. In fact, he is the one who started the church. He launched this great thing. And if we are going to go back there to understand why and how so that we can run with the same purposes into the future. And so in Matthew 16, 18, Jesus says this to Peter after Peter declared, Declares the revelation that he's had about Jesus, that Jesus is the Son of the living God. And it says this He says, Jesus says to Peter, I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. This is on this rock, on this revelation of who Jesus is, Jesus will build his church. Now, it's so important for us to realize there what church means, because Jesus only uses this word church twice, and he uses it both in Matthew's gospel in 16 and chapter 18. And so this, this word, we've become so used to the word church being the building that I go to. So if I go to church, it means I'm going to a location where it has building, it has pews, it has screens, it has whatever, musical instruments, whatever the building that you've associated, you think that's, I'm going to church. But that's not Jesus' intention at all because Jesus didn't come to say, hey, I'm going to build a building that people are going to come to. No, he has come to build a community. He has come to build something bigger than just four walls around people. He has come to build his gathering. The ecclesia is the Greek word there used for church that he's used twice. What ecclesia means, it's the called out ones, people that have come to assemble. It's a, it's a congregation. In fact, uh, the definition is it's a gathering of citizens called out from their homes into some public place, an assembly. 
So what Jesus is saying is that I'm going on this revelation of who he is. He is going to build an assembly. He is going to build a gathering. People who are called out from the world to do community around the person and the revelation of Jesus. What an exciting thing that he is building. So the church isn't a building we go to. The church is a building that we're already part of. It's the it's his body. It's what he is building in the earth in many different places, locally expressed as what is globally expressed. And I love that. We are called out people of Jesus, his community who follow him. We are a people who have received a new covenant, a new promise, the salvation of our souls, the forgiveness of our sins by the grace of our Lord Jesus. I love that. The church is built on this revelation of who Jesus is and on, upon his salvation. It's so important that we realize that the church is not a man-made idea of how we can get to God. It is not a man-made organization of how we can live more mor mor moralistic lives, of how we can do better works or, or how we can act right and we can have just relationships with people. Church is not a country club. It is something that Jesus is building on the revelation of who he is. It's his idea. The church is all birthed in and of Jesus. Because remember, if we lose our why, we will lose our way. If we forget that the purpose of the church was Jesus, that the founder of the church is Jesus, then we will begin to make up our own why and our own way that is disconnected from the heartbeat of God. And so in this message, I just want to share three simple points to you, with you. Number one is that the church is supernatural. The church is supernatural. It is built upon a supernatural revelation of who Jesus is. Like, get this as a note. This church, the church that you and I are a part of, it exists here because of a revelation that we've had about Jesus. How crazy is that? A two, almost a 2,000-year revelation, the church is still being built on that. It's a, I mean, that's just, it's powerful. The power of the church is not in... Oh, it is written. The power of the church isn't what we find in Scripture. The power of the church is not what was written, but the power of the church is that He has risen. The fact that Jesus rose from the dead is the very reason why we have a church, why the church lives and breathes, why the church was even started. The church is because Jesus rose. You know, the church, when it started, it was this little Jewish sect of people that had had believed in the Messiah, believed that Jesus came, and they believed that Jesus was from God and that he rose from the dead. But there was no reason for this little Jewish sect to thrive, to grow, and to continue to expand throughout the world unless it had a supernatural foundation, a supernatural revelation that God has been to the planet in the form of Jesus Christ, who lived the perfect life, who showed us who God really is, and who died on a cross because of our sin to take our guilt and our punishment that was due to us and take it in place of ourselves, that He would forgive us of our sins, that He would restore us into a relationship with our Heavenly Father, that He was executed because of these great claims that He made. He, he went to the cross not because of all the people He healed. He didn't go to the cross because of all the people He helped and because of all the love that He gave. He went to that cross because He made claims that He was God and that He was bringing the forgiveness of God and the kingdom of heaven to the earth. Those are really bold claims to make. His death was necessary for God to forgive human sinfulness in the perfection of Jesus. The leader of this movement, Jesus, was executed. Now, generally, movements die out when their leaders die or they lose momentum. But there was something about the message and the power and the person of Jesus that launched the church into a supernatural event, a supernatural life. Think about it. They were all gathered together. People were gathered together. They were lost. They were confused. Their leader had just been executed by, by the way, people who were really good at executing people, the Romans on the, on the cross. 
through crucifixion, a gruesome way to die. They were certain that he died. His followers lost and worried and concerned. What are we going to do? They see, his, they see their leader being put into a tomb and a stone rolled over it and a, and a guard put around it and a seal across the tomb. It was over. But something happened that would change the course of human history. Two women went down to the tomb to, to put um, spices on Jesus' body, just to, to give him proper burial rites. And when they got there, the tomb was empty. There was nobody in the tomb. The gods had no idea what was going on. Jesus was raised to life. He was resurrected. The tomb was empty. It was done. Death was done. It's amazing that the start of the church was the resurrection of the life of Jesus. That's why I say the news of the church isn't that it is written. The news of the church is that he is risen. The fact that the church has power, the fact that the church is even alive today is Traced back to an event that Jesus rose from the dead, that the tomb was empty in Jesus' name. And not only that, not only do we have that as an account, but we also see that more than 500 people saw Jesus after he died. After that account of his resurrection, more than 500 people saw him. He also revealed himself to eyewitnesses, to his, his, his disciples, to his apostles. He revealed himself. It's amazing. I witnessed to a supernatural resurrection by the power of God. You see, the accounts of the scriptures is not, it's not just an idea about Jesus. When you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these are eyewitness accounts to the story and the life of Jesus. That though he went into a grave, he came out resurrected. He came out live again. All the claims that he made about who he was, about him being God, about him bringing the forgiveness of sin to the world, that he was beginning to build a new people, a new creation. All of that had authority because he rose again from the dead. And these eyewitness accounts, they show it. These accounts of, of, of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it's not written hundreds of years later as like a legend. These were written by the people who were alive with Jesus at the time. In fact, in Luke's gospel, uh, chapter one, when he starts to write, he says, you know what, I've, I've, these are, the, these are the, the words that have come down to us. And I've taken it upon myself to do a thorough investigation of it so that you can be sure that these events have taken place painstakingly people have documented the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. But beyond that, we see James. Come on, James, who was Jesus's brother. Now, let me ask you this. What would you have to do to convince your sibling that you are God? You'd probably have to rise from the dead, wouldn't you? Because James didn't believe in Jesus until he saw him at the resurrection. Go past James's letter to, about Jesus to Paul, Oh, we love, we love Paul. We love the messages and the letters he's written. We love the fact that he documents the church through Acts and uh, through Luke's writing and, and all the letters he's penned to the church. But you know that Paul was the greatest persecutor of the church at the start of the church? He wanted to destroy the church. He was evil bent on destroying anybody who proclaimed Jesus was risen. Until one day he had a supernatural encounter with the risen Lord. And from that moment... He stopped persecuting the church and eventually gave his life for the church. He gave his life to proclaim the message of Jesus. That the grave is empty, that sins are forgiven, that Jesus is alive. What would you have to do? What, what event would have to have taken place for you to be willing to die for such a message? The fact that Jesus was risen. Without the resurrection, there is no church. It's not man's idea. It comes from a supernatural event that took place. It is the body of Christ found upon the greatest revelation. It is not a country club. It's not a place where we come to for benefits. It's a place that we live and die and have community in because we've had a revelation that Jesus is alive, that he defeated death, that the tomb wasn't strong enough to hold him there. 
In fact, Paul, who I was just talking about, said this in 1 Corinthians 15. And if Christ has not been risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we, of, we are of all people most to be pitied. If we lose our why, we will lose our way. If we lose the fact that the church was started and hinges on the resurrection of Jesus, that everything you and I do within the body of Christ all hinges on the fact that Jesus rose from the dead. If we don't believe that he rose from the dead, we are to be pitied. Without Jesus' resurrection, the church is not a real thing. The church is empty of its power. Go join a tennis club, brother. It's easier. But if Jesus has risen, the church is supernatural. And that's the revelation we come around. The second thing is this, that the church is intentional. So the church started because of an event where Jesus rose from the dead. The tomb was empty. We've spoken about that so many times. But it was birthed at Pentecost where, where Peter got up under the power of the Holy Spirit and preached the gospel. 3,000 people got saved in a moment. And then something had to happen. They believed the message that Jesus was risen from the dead. They believed that Jesus was from God and that he would forgive them of their sins. But they had to organize themselves. Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. Luke writes this. He says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together, had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying favor of all people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You see, what happened is they believed this great message of Jesus. But they were still Jewish people and they were still had this idea of how to relate to God through the temple and through home. So what they did is they organized themselves in a way that they could have fellowship, that they could build the church, that they could be the church, they could be the called out ones for Jesus. And so they would meet in the temple every single day. They would go there to get instruction about Jesus. They would... They would be taught by the apostles about who Jesus was. How did Jesus live? What did Jesus say? Because the Bible wasn't there when, the, when, when, Jesus, uh, when Jesus rose to, to heaven. The Bible wasn't there when the church was started. The apostles had orally learned all the things that Jesus had taught them. And they were teaching the disciples, all these new people, the same things. Well, this is how Jesus shared his life with people. This is how Jesus was generous. This is how Jesus healed people. This is how to follow Jesus. We only have the scriptures because of later on they decided to write these things down. But right in the beginning of church, they, were, they came to the temple to learn about the person of Jesus from the people that followed him closely. I love that. And then they went home and they had fellowship. They, they ate meals together. They prayed together. They, they did the breaking of bread together. And they continued the conversation about Jesus. Can you can imagine this, like, Peter teaching about Jesus in the temple and then they go home. And say, Can you believe that Peter said this about Jesus? I wonder how true it was. I wonder, I wonder how he did it. I wonder, I wonder what Peter must have felt like when he walked out on the water to go and meet Jesus. And then they go back to the temple the next day and they, they lean in more and they, they listen more to the story of Jesus. They did that so they could learn how to follow and how to obey Jesus. They went to temples and to homes to hear the teachings of Jesus and how to follow and obey them. And this community, this church, this ecclesia, this gathering came together to do that through relationship. I would even be as bold to say that I don't know if it's possible to follow Jesus authentically without being connected into his community. People who feel like they can follow Jesus on their own, I I don't think you can do it. I don't think it's possible because he is building a community of people called out from the world to do life together to, on the revelation of his resurrection and, how to, and learn how to follow him. So that's why we do services and groups. 
It's vital for participation in the life of the church that we, we come together like this right now and we worship together. We learn about Jesus together. But then we break up into groups around the communities so that we can learn how to follow Him together and walk together. But there were distinguishing factors in this early church in Acts chapter 2. One of them is what, it was the message that they believed about Jesus. Honestly, if Jesus hadn't have risen, the church would never have started because there was way too much persecution that came against the church. There was no benefit in it for the, uh, for the early apostles. There was no benefit unless what they had seen was true and real and people believed it. The other distinguishing factor is that it was the love that they shared. Jesus said this in, in John chapter 13. He said, by the way that you love one another, people will know that you're my disciples. Love was a distinguishing factor in the early church, and it should be still to this day. And signs and wonders, the presence of the Holy Spirit gave the, the teaching great authority. It's one thing to say that Jesus is ridden, risen. It's another thing to experience it. It's one thing to say that I can be healed. It's another thing to experience it. And so that's why the presence of the Holy Spirit is so important and powerful for the church today. And the last thing is this, that the church is unstoppable. So firstly, we see that the church is supernatural, has a supernatural origin, the resurrection of Jesus and the moment of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. The church is intentional that we fo they formed a way to do life as a community together. Lastly, the church is unstoppable because the church has gone all over the world. Even more than almost 2,000 years later, the church is still continuing to thrive. The church is still continuing to grow. The church is still continuing the mission of Jesus on the earth. Because back to Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said, I will build my ecclesia, my gathering, my assembly, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do you know how many times the devil has tried to stop the church from moving forward? Each and every generation has obstacles that it has to face. But Jesus promised he's going to protect the building of his assembly because he wants the message of, of forgiveness of sin to reach all around the world, to bring people into community, into new life, into new creation. Jesus protects the testimony of the church. Like I said, there's no reason why the church should have gone from a small Jewish sect in Jerusalem to a global movement unless it was birthed from God. Think about it. I mean, these guys, they got together and they were quaking in their boots after Jesus died. Then upon his resurrection, they were like, no, he is alive. It is true. He is God. And we're going to go everywhere and tell everybody this. But it was just a little Jewish movement. It, 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 it just stayed in Jerusalem. It didn't have, like there was, the only reason it went outside of Jerusalem was because persecution came. Because they were starting to teach people about this resurrected Jesus and put the Jewish leaders under threat. So they started to persecute them. Remember Paul, who started to persecute the church and kill people and drag them off into jail? So the church started, people started going all over the place. And wherever they went, they told people that Jesus was the son of the living God who died but was raised again to life. And people believed this message everywhere they went. But the, the community of Jesus was strengthened. The church spread from Jerusalem to Samaria to a place called Antioch, into Rome and into all different places of the earth. You know, a lot of, a lot of um, religions, you can actually trace back to a type of people or a type of tribe or a type of ethnicity. If you think about Islam, how it's very dominant in, in uh, the Arabic countries. If you think about um, Hinduism, how it's very dominant in the East. Do you know that the church of Jesus Christ is for every tribe, every language, every tongue, every ethnicity? There is not a place in the planet today where the church is not there. It's for all people. It's gone in all places. The apostles took the message of Jesus everywhere at the cost of their own lives. It wasn't for their fame. They weren't building a business. They weren't building an empire. They were carrying a message of the forgiveness of sins on the basis of the resurrection that happened, that they saw, that they witnessed. They took it everywhere. And they, they, their lives is what they sacrificed in the process. 
Now, uh, I, I was very interested to see what happened to the apostles when they went out. Because the Bible, I think, only records maybe Peter and Paul and James, I think. Not even Paul. Peter and James are being executed. But this is just some legend, as we see on, as I uh, researched it. Peter and Paul were both martyred in Rome around AD 66 during the persecution under Emperor Nero. Paul was beheaded and Peter was crucified upside down because he didn't want to die the same way Jesus died. Andrew, one of the apostles, he went to the Soviet Union and he was the first to bring the gospel there. He also preached in Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey and in Greece. And he is also said to be crucified. Thomas, which we uh, would some know as Doubting Thomas, uh, he went as far as India and where the ancient Marthoma Christians revere him as their founder. They claim that he died there when pierced through with spears of four soldiers. Philip, who had a powerful ministry in Carthage, North Africa, and in Asia Minor, um, he was arrested and cruelly put to death. Matthew, the tax collector and the writer of the gospel, went to Persia and Ethiopia. And some say he wasn't martyred. Others say he was stabbed to death. Bartholomew, uh, he, went, he was widespread missionary. He, he went to India with Thomas, back to Armenia, to Ethiopia and South, South, Southern Arabia. And various accounts of how he met his death as a martyr of the gospel. James, the son of Alphaeus, is one of the, the least three James in the New Testament. He is reckoned to have ministered in Syria. And he was reported to be stoned and clubbed to death. And it goes on and on and on. But not only this, as the message of the gospel began to go throughout the whole world, it literally started going to all corners of the earth. And we know that Rome took it to a whole nother level. Do you know in the time where Paul was ministering and beyond that, what they would do with Christians in the streets of Rome is that they would tie them up onto poles and they would set them at light. They would set them on fire at night so that they would light the streets. The streets of Rome were filled with the screams of Christians dying. Not only that, but they also gathered them into the circus, into, into the, uh, the Colosseum. And they would throw them out there to wild beasts to be torn apart. Tell me, how can a church survive that unless it was supernatural? Unless it was God's idea to bring the message of hope, truth, and love, the message of Jesus to the whole world. You see, the devil in each and every um, generation has tried to kill the church, but there is no stopping what God has started. If we lose our why, we will lose our way. The message of the church is not that it is written, but that Jesus is risen. We have a powerful truth to communicate to all the world that Jesus Christ has come to save the life of all who will believe. Even today, people are dying for their faith. In fact, some people say that more Christians are dying today than ever before in the history of the world. You cannot stop the church. The church is God's idea. The church is God's plan to seek and save the lost. So what? So what now? So why do we build the church? Why do you serve? Why do you serve in kids' church? Why do you serve a church online? Why do you gather together in groups? Why do we come and gather together as a church? It is because Jesus is risen. That is our why. That is the whole purpose for us breathing and proclaiming Jesus. We don't gather to become better. We gather so that we can bear the testimony of Jesus and become more like Him. Jesus said this in Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Therefore, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is calling us to be co-laborers in the building of his church. We do everything in our church because Jesus is risen and he has called us out to go and make disciples, to spread the message of a risen Lord, who forgives us of our sin and to help people to follow him in everyday life. That's our call. That's our mission. That's why we do what we do. He is the founder of the church. He is the sustainer of the church. And Jesus is coming back for the church at the end of the age. So if your fire has gone out, 
And maybe you're thinking, oh man, this church thing, I just don't, I just don't get it. And I understand, sometimes our passion can wane. Sometimes we can lose our fire. But the only reason you lose your fire is because you have forgotten the miracle of someone coming back from the dead. Because hey, if someone comes back from the dead, I'm going to listen to what they have to say. Jesus loves you. He cares about you. Let's not lose the foundation of our faith. Or maybe your fire has gone out because we've stopped following him. We've, we've got the fact that he has risen somewhere in the back there. But we've stopped being disciples. We've stopped following him. We've stopped trying to do what he's told us to do. If you want your fire back, go all in with Jesus. Do what he said. Go and tell someone about Jesus. Build the church of Jesus. And I believe that God's going to set a flame. Because remember, in the promise of Jesus in Acts chapter 1 was that he would be baptizing us with the fire of God. I want fire in your belly for the church of Jesus Christ to carry the message of Jesus to the world. God bless you. I hope that this has been helpful to you as we launch out in this series called Ecclesia about the what is the church? What is the purposes of the church? And we're going to get that into the next couple of weeks. But right now, I want to pray for two groups of people. I want to pray for you if, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you just thought maybe that this church thing was a cool idea, there were nice people there, they do cool things, and we want to make church fun. But church isn't here because it's fun. Church is here because Jesus died and rose again. And I want to invite you into the community of faith. And the beautiful thing is that Jesus says that you don't have to do any good works. You don't have to be good enough. You don't have to achieve any sort of level to be accepted. You just have to believe the news of His resurrection and that He is the Son of the living God. And what does that cause us to do? Repent of our sin, to believe this message and to receive Him into our life. I want to pray for you. Right now, just turn your hands to heaven if you want to accept the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Father, I thank you. People who are putting their faith into, in you all over the place. I thank you, Lord, that this is a prayer and a confession that millions upon millions of people have made all across the world throughout the generations. That you are the Son of the living God who takes away our sins. So, Lord, I pray right now that they would have faith to believe in you, come into their heart, forgive them of their sins, and make them alive. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Well done. I'm so happy for you. What an amazing testimony you have. Because from here, you can literally just go out and tell people, Jesus is alive, and that is enough. We would love to celebrate with you. And the way that we can do that is you just let us know by hitting the, hey, I want to follow Jesus button at Church Online, or by all of the other channels going to our online connection card and filling it out there and we can email you some information to help you to take your next step but if you i want to pray for those of you who've let your fire wane down a little bit i just want to pray that, that the lord's gonna stoke that fire again we're going into again a unique season of building the church online and in person but you know what it's never dull it's always exciting and i want to pray for you so father right now i pray for anyone whose faith has waned anybody who's feeling heavy, anybody who is feeling like disillusioned and who's been lost and isolated. Lord, I pray again for a boldness and a fire from the Holy Spirit that we would continue to build the church of Jesus Christ and to be the church of Jesus Christ where we are and when we gather. We ask this in your mighty name. Amen. Amen.